David Stevens refers often to a spiritual life in his exhibition of sculptures at Philadelphia's Center for Art and Wood. The show is entitled Auguries of Idolatry, and in it are four large multi-part pieces. Gethsemane Gate, Cenotaph Tower of Brothers Blood, Seduced by Royal Trappings, and Peeled Turf. An augury is a sign of what will happen in the future, often a prediction of death. Idolatry refers to a sinful worship of objects instead of God. This is an interestingly ironic idea for a sculptor. David Stevens is a very bright man and there are meanings and counter meanings in his work that I won't even pretend to understand. But at its core, his work is about the profound meaningfulness of human life, its joys and its tragedies. A cenotaph is an empty tomb or monument erected in honor of people whose remains are elsewhere. David's cenotaph seems to memorialize men from his community who died before their time, either by murder or suicide, bad choices, or by the bad choices of others. He told me a bit about his life and its impact upon his art. I'm a sculptor and I got interested in art when I was about seven years old. And that's because my mother was not allowed to become an artist. So she supported me in terms of my becoming an artist. Even though I decided to be an artist, I didn't even know what an artist was. And I had never been to a museum or anything, but early on we got some Funk and Wagner encyclopedias. In volume two of those encyclopedias was art. And one of the things that I saw in that was uh, Brancusi's bird, bird in space. We were in North Carolina and a few years later moved to Philadelphia and wound up going to the Philadelphia Museum and there was the sculpture. And at that point I was hooked. I studied printmaking at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Printmaking was too indirect, so I decided I'd go into sculpture and I got into graduate school at Tyler School of Art. Did you start out as a figurative sculptor or did you always have started? No, I've never been a figurative artist. I made the conscious decision not to be a figurative artist. And this work reflects some of that and that's because of the religious edict against making graven images. So you take that seriously, I guess? Tongue in cheek on some level because there are figurative references to a lot of my work. In one of your works, it almost looks like a toy robot with a big gun. Am I making that up? Or yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's nip that right now. <laughs> That's not true? No. Okay, okay. One of the facts of David's life is that as an adult, he slowly became blind. I have glaucoma, and so I lost it about 14 years ago in the year 2000. I did go to a blindness school for a year. I never got down in the dumps about becoming blind because I was so busy doing work. I just continued working. And so it's not been an issue, except I need somebody to guide me from time to time or to take me to buy materials and this, that, and the other. What well, is it meant to me as an artist? I find it to be not a disability for me, but an inconvenience. And so all of the work in this exhibition I did myself. The assistance that I did have was to develop a grid for the Braille. So I developed the grid and taught assistants how to lay out the grid and where to drill so that I could put the furniture buttons on that I used. That peel turf, the very large Braille bumps, I didn't use anybody to grid those. I figured that out myself. I don't read Braille. Are there messages? <laughs> yeah, they all say things, but people who read Braille couldn't read this because Braille is very size specific. There is a Braille for people with small fingers called Japanese Braille. Then there is standard Braille. Then there is the Braille that I learned to read on, which is California Braille, for people with some sensory deprivation in their fingers. Mine comes from working in this wood. I have calluses on my fingers that are not noticeable, but they are there. And then there's elephant Braille for people who have extreme sensory deprivation from stuff such as diabetes. So this Braille would not make sense to people who read Braille because it's so large. 
You seem like a very intellectual guy. How about reading? Do you use audiobooks? Yes, and I listen to the radio. When I was in the blindness school, I did learn to read Braille, but it just takes so much time to do so. Six positions for each character. When I retired, I went to Associated Services for the Blind, and there was this intake person, and she was there typing on this little thing, whatever I said to her, and then she'd play it back, and I said, what is that? Then when I went to the blind school, the kids had these things, but they weren't interested in anything but writing nonsense into them and playing them back as sort of musical instruments. <laughs> I can see why David loves this story. One of his favorite artists is the composer John Cage, who often used randomness in his musical works. Can you tell me a little bit about the technical aspects of it? How did you make these things? Are they nailed together? No, they're all dowels. They're glue and dowels. And I use these huge saws and so forth. I have all tame fingers. <laughs> uh, and when I have assistance, I don't allow the assistants to use any of the major dangerous tools. What kind of wood is it? Poplar wood, some oak. Without your sight, can you have a sense of what it would look like just by feeling it? or? Well, I have to conceptualize it before I make it, so I know what it looks like. <laughs> this is a little bit like Beethoven writing symphonies while deaf? Yes. <laughs> Do you have memories of color? Well, yes. I have a graduate degree in sculpture, but most of my experience has not been with sculpture. I reverted back to sculpture when I started to become blind. Otherwise, I did paintings and large color pencil drawings. So I have a lot of experience with color, and what I do is I negotiate the colors with the assistants. The titles, the formal symmetry, and the iconic presences in David's work all connote a sense of religion. Can you talk about your religious beliefs and how they impact this work? It's not my religious beliefs per se. It's my interest in religion. So some of the work has to do with Judeo-Christian aspects. Some of it has to do with pre-Christian and so-called primitive religions. It's all over the place because of my interest in world religion, not specifically Christianity, although I was raised a Christian and taught to read using the Bible. But I do want to learn more about the Hindu text and the Arabic text. a very moving quality to me. What do you want the viewer to take away from the experience of looking at your work? Well, whatever their experience is and whatever they bring to it, it's open to some interpretation, although the works themselves do have a kind of narrative to them. I call it a factored narrative, which is a play on fractured narrative. If I talk to you about the four major installations here, the Gethsemane Gate does have something to do with the Garden of Gethsemane, which is spoken of in a couple of the Gospels. Gethsemane was the place where a distraught Jesus prayed on the night that he was betrayed by Judas. The Gospel of Luke says, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Seduced by royal trappings it has to do with the royalty and how we take off on royalty. It has to do to a great extent with secular royalty. There's that connection between secular royalty and religious royalty. The artist and critic Gerard Brown writes about this piece. If one purpose of sculpture is to commemorate, yet another might be to assert power. I think David is right. We're all but drowning these days in a sea of secular royalty, from the tabloid pop stars to the super rich. Our celebrities have become like depraved gods, dominating our consciousness. Peel turf, that has to do with what I plan to be doing henceforth. I'm at the end of putting all the effort into making these huge things, it's like <laughs> rough. And so now I'm interested in taking the Braille and putting it into an architectural format and doing Braille gardens. Peeled turf is thus a model for a type of gigantic piece of environmental art. Each Braille bump would be blown up to at least five square feet in diameter. 
the Braille itself would relate to the particular installation. The show's curator, Robin Rice, told me that one possible example would use the first names of the donors for the text. I've been negotiating with a couple of organizations to make these Braille gardens. All right, David, I'm gonna ask a very important question. Go ahead. How many fingers? <laughs> <All right>. Twelve. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you get when you have a very smart guy with a great sense of humor, a keen mind's eye, and a stoic courage? You get David Stevens, an artist who really knows what he's doing. I put it all together myself. Sometimes it amazes me that I'm able to do it. Thank you so much. You're it was quite a great, great pleasure. Okay. <laughs>